everybody. My name is Sammy Riccio, and I am the Donor Engagement Coordinator here at Hawkwatch International. And I want to welcome you to 35 Years in Counting, which is our five-week program celebrating our 35 years of raptor migration monitoring, culminating in our virtual gala. So today we are here for Building the Next Generation of Biologists, featuring the 2021 migration crew. And I want to thank our sponsors for making this event possible. UAMPS, Caddis Enterprises, Next Era Energy, ANSAC, Pol Polich Law, Rocky Mountain Power, Terracon, Enyo Renewable Energies, and Tab Bank. If you too want to contribute to raptor conservation and keep us counting for another 35 years, please consider making a contribution at hawkwatch.org slash donate or text hawkwatch, all one word, to 56651. So this presentation will last about 35 minutes and then we'll be followed up with a question and answer session with Jessica Taylor, our field biologist and migration crew veteran. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to use the Q&A feature so we can easily find your questions. So with that, let us begin our presentation. Being in nature is being out of your own element, being in a world and an ecosystem that you can't predict what's going to happen, using all of your senses to explore in new ways. Whenever I'm out in nature, like I just feel very at peace and at home. Of like This is the world in its natural state. This is how things should be. Anytime I'm outside, I'm curious, constantly asking questions about everything. As a scientist, nature to me asks a lot of questions and I love thinking of ways to answer them. My name is Cody Allen. I'm Jojo Morelli. I'm Nicole Richardson. My name is Ellie McManus. Hello, I'm Dane Farrell. My name is Melissa Marshall. I'm Kate Stroik. I'm Erin Berry. My name is Frankie Virla. I'm Daniel. I'm Veronica Pedraza. My name is Nora. My name is Coburn Blunt. My name is Casty Rugi. My name is James Peterson. I took an ornithology course in college and I was hooked instantly. I just kind of gravitated towards birds and raptors. I remember just at my grandparents' house, just like reading the Peterson Field Guide they had, like it was, you know, like a graphic novel. After I kind of discovered how cool birds were, it seemed like it divided my life into two parts. There was before, when I appreciated everything and kind of liked everything, and then when I got into birds, it was just like a whole second part of my life, and I finally figured out like what I should be doing. They're kind of seen as like this elusive creature that's hard to find, but actually like if you spend the time to go and look for them, they're everywhere. And there's so many different species, so many different little ecological niches. There's a lot that's unknown. I think similar to, you know, fish in the ocean, birds fill the air, and it's kind of an unknown territory for humans, which excites me and interests me. And I think it poses a lot of challenges to researching them but it's really exciting. You can go out, you see something different every day. You see something unusual, you see something common. There's always something new, it's different. It's never exactly the same. I've been bird watching for over 20 years. Um, and so that progressed from bird watching to, you know, wanting to enter this field to help conserve the birds that I grew up watching and loving. When I was young, I was really curious. I'd look at the frogs and snakes and turtles in, in the woods. But one day, a pair of robins built a nest on my parents' back porch. And I got really curious. And at the age of 13, you get really curious and you go, go with it for a while. I kept thinking I had to look for answers on the internet and then suddenly realized I could find the answers myself. And I spent a lot of time doing that. And it led me down this whole track of bird watching. And so before I was even out of university, I started field work with birds, and that's been my life since. It's my whole life now.
The Migration Network is a, a set of currently seven sites. These are long-term sites where we have crews of people that basically are on site for a fixed time each year, year after year, counting the same way in the same place. One of the best parts of the network to me is the camaraderie that it builds. When you find this small group of like-minded people who are just as passionate as you are, and then you get to spend time with them and learn from them or mentor someone else who's really young and just starting in the field, it's a really wonderful experience. We, we tout and our goal for this migration network is to have all the sites be a place of learning and sharing and that's, that's the spirit that we're, we're working towards. A typical day on Commissary Ridge looks a lot like this. <laughs> <laughs> Got a bird in between the quills and Rohan, closer to the quills. It was oh, an yeah. eye bird. I see it. Oh, I got it. It is a bald eagle. What a beauty. To start the day, we usually wake up in the morning around 7, 7.30. Depending a lot on the weather, you know, you'll roll out of your sleeping bag in the morning to be icy cold air, get dressed for the day in icy cold clothes. The art of being uncomfortable is a, is a beautiful thing, you know? We get ourselves ready and we get the lure birds ready, so we feed them and clean them in the morning. Um, and then we make sure we have all the supplies for wherever we're stationed for the day, whether that be at the banding blind or if we're up at observations doing the count. We kind of split up into two teams. One team goes to observation and then the other team goes to the blind. And from there we kind of just spend the day either trapping rafters or counting rafters. We spend most of the day up here counting. We're here until six most days unless the weather pulls us off. When we're scanning and looking for birds that are migrating through, the first step is actually finding the bird. The scanning technique we use, which is um, we usually start from either the west or the east and then go slowly up and down until we reach uh, a northern point, which is usually Mount Hood, which we use as a landmark. We use that scanning technique because it allows you to catch birds as they're flying south. Many times you will be scanning and then you'll just notice a speck in your binoculars and then you'll follow that speck and sometimes you won't be able to identify it and that's okay. But it's just trying to keep track of where it's going and then if we can tell that it's flying south past the butte, then we're able to count it and add it to our tally. Every hour what we're doing is we are taking um, weather to see kind of the conditions like the wind, the air temperature, the um, how the clouds are doing, as well as where the birds are flying. So we see how far are they flying? Are they flying above us? Are they flying close to us? So the, all, all the information is being input into a tablet that gets uploaded to Dunkadoo, which is the app that we use, uh, which then gets uploaded to hotcount.org, which is where all of the different hawk watches throughout North America, that's where all of their data goes as well. You're in your binoculars all day and scanning and identifying birds. When you're on a bird, you I first try to ID it to family. Like I'll see, I have a bird and then excipiter and then I'll go sharp and hawk. You have to take everything into account for these birds. Tail length, uh, wing size, wing shape, flight behavior. Identification of raptors is quite difficult, especially when they're really far away. We basically have to focus on their silhouette and their flight pattern. And these are all things that, you know, are really intricate and maybe wouldn't apply to super close-up identification. And it, I, I do love that challenge in it, and it makes it a really unique experience and a cool thing to talk to people about. And 
once you learn bird ID and bird song, it's kind of like speaking a whole new language. When you're hawk watching up here, you're not just looking in one direction. A lot of the hawks, you know, will be migrating from the north, but you'll be scanning to the east and the west and even behind you to the south. And on good days when the visibility is good, you can see in all directions. It's amazing. Sharpshin and Cooper's hawks, especially sharpshin hawks, goshawks, some of the birds we see up here, especially like sharpies in really high numbers. I never see them any other time of the year, but sometimes we see, you know, 200 or 300 in a day. It's unlike anything to see raptors migrate in such high numbers. Sitting in the blind is exciting because you never know when there's the next bird migrating through and it might come into the set and it's game on. Pretty sure we perched over there. I don't see it. But... We catch birds first and foremost, we're banding them. And banding them is an effective mark recapture method where if someone else captures the bird, they know where and when it was banded, what health it was in, how old it was when it was first banded. We can also learn a lot about their movements as well if a bird's captured somewhere else. If a bird is banded here and recaptured at another hawk watch site further south, for example, we learn about how long it took the bird to maybe get there, which direction maybe it would have gone. We can learn all kinds of other amazing things about birds, though, by banding them. With a bird in the hand, you can see plumage details that you cannot see in the field. Uh, one thing I'm personally very passionate about is molt. So birds have to replace their plumage every year, and in raptors, they don't replace all of it. They'll hang on to feathers year after year, and you can see differences in fade and wear in the feathers. And so by studying that, we can learn a lot about the life history of a bird, a lot about its health, where it came from. We have a lot of different subspecies for a lot of the raptors that we have here as well. Nowadays, we have digital photography, which is absolutely incredible. And we can take a photo of a bird and in a very short time collect an incredible amount of data on it. Six of the seven migration sites that we have are located on ridges where the airlift and the thermals really allow these birds to, to migrate really efficiently. And then we have this outlier migration site on the Gulf Coast in Corpus Christi which doesn't seem to fit from a landscape perspective, but from a migration perspective, it's incredibly important because it sees more migratory raptors than any other site in North America. And so while the mountain ridges face challenges from the weather like snow and wind and cold, the Corpus Christi site faces its own unique challenges of really high temperatures and high humidity and lots of bugs and lots of people. And they're counting hundreds of thousands of birds every year, which is a really spectacular thing to watch. If you've ever looked at a map, most of us have, the state of Texas narrows down as it gets further to the south. All these flyways, the eastern flyway, the central flyway, and even the western flyway funnel into Texas. This area is known as the coastal bend because this is the first opportunity that the birds have to go south. So on a ridge site, you have winds um, that the birds can use to get lift. They don't want to flap all the way to South America. That takes way too much energy and they just can't do it. Thermal is formed when the sun hits the land. It creates these columns of hot rising air. So a hawk gets in this thermal and it's just like an elevator. It circles around with the wings set 
it goes higher and higher and higher until, I don't know, the cruising altitude, and then it comes out and it can uh, glide then until the next thermal. And so the, the hawks will use their incredible eyesight uh, to find another uh, raptor that's in a thermal five miles ahead. So a typical day at Corpus, you know, we, we show up 10 minutes before nine, we set up, you know, everything. So the data station, you know, we bring our coolers and scopes and chairs. We move with the shade, we scan uh, for every moment of those eight hours, looking for raptors and what is a very big sky. We will wait for them to kettle uh, as they hit that thermal. And then as soon as they think that they've got the lift that they need, they will start streaming in a very orderly fashion. And we use clickers, which are just little tally counters. And we envision chunks of, a, you know, some, some unit like 10s, 50s, 1s, 100s. We set a frame uh, of 10 birds and then we click. And then 10 birds click, 10 birds click. It's, it's a challenge, but like getting it down is, is really important and making sure we get the numbers right because we do get a lot of birds. Communication is just super important. We'll be um, talking to each other about who's counting and they'll be clicking those birds. And then once they've got a count, they'll give it either directly to the person collecting data or to Bob, who is wonderful and collects our data for us. Because we get so many different birds and so many birds, he will jot down what we see, we'll, we'll call out to Bob, hey Bob, one kestrel, one Cooper's hawk, one sharp shin. Then towards the end of the hour, we actually enter them into the tablet. When you're picking up your binoculars, you are seeing something almost immediately. Counting migrating birds might seem a little simple, but in its entirety is actually very complex. An individual might not seem like much, but when you put that individual in the scope of thousands and hundreds of thousands of migrants that travel through North America every year, you see this larger picture of the importance of migration as well as conservation. It's one of the easiest things we can do to get a picture of population trends and movement trends in any type of wildlife because birds are just very prolific and very easy to see and find and that's what makes them such good ecological indicators for when something is going wrong and we're seeing downward trends in populations. We're counting over the course of 20, 30, 40, 50 even years in one location. And so that gives us an idea of how populations change over time. The value of the data is so, so immense. It's because of Hawkwatch sites like this that we, we even have, you know, peregrine falcons in the sky. They would have been completely wiped out by DDT uh, 70 years ago now, had it not been for sites counting them each fall and, and understanding that their, their numbers are declining, you know, so we have to be up here in order to keep an eye on how they're doing. An individual dot on a graph doesn't mean much, but when you put it in the context of the fact that that individual dot represents a population of birds that are extremely reliant on a certain resource or a certain habitat, and we have the ability to potentially communicate with others and protect that resource and make that resource beneficial for both wildlife and humans, that's really powerful. So we want to change the outlook of raptors into not just simply these mysterious birds that are passing through, but something that is really tangible and something that is not just a dot on a graph, but educational material and collaborative material that we can share across the nation and hopefully the globe. Once the winter months hit, uh, we get into October, definitely November, snow starts coming, it gets really cold. We term the phrase layers and prayers because <laughs> there's not much you can do. <gasps> We're counting nearly every single day for 90 days. I mean, we work six days on, one day off, and for me, I typically 
go outside and do more birding on my day off so I'm you know never taking a break but you're working eight hours a day for six days a week sometimes more we don't have a mountain to climb every day uh, but we do have 90 to 100 plus degree days uh, with a typically above 60 percent humidity a lot of bugs it's a lot you know just sitting here in the heat baking in the sun uh, or baking in the shade honestly here particularly because it's arizona the first week we were sitting in the sun in 90 plus degree weather baking in direct sunlight for nine hours every day and there were no birds so that was a bit of a challenge However, now it's, it's getting a bit chilly. There was maybe five inches of snow on the ground the other day and it's been snowstorming. So really interesting coming prepared for a wide array of weather conditions. <laughs> Being able to stand up there for the entire nine hours uh, in the sun and the heat as well as the cold and the wind and the rain and the snow. I mean, birds are flying through those conditions and we have to stand up there and weather those conditions as well so that we can continue to count those birds so that we can continue to take the pulse of the daily migration. During the slow times, I daydream about the good times. It's not difficult to keep yourselves entertained during the slow times. Uh, if there isn't a bird in the sky, it's still amazing to look at the landscape and to have conversations, whether it's about professional things or really goofy, silly things. So a lot of great conversations all the time up, up on the observation I point. Like, I was doing 10 bees at that point, so I was like, I could do A really long day in the blind turns around in a heartbeat when we catch one bird. Because it reminds me that I, to appreciate that bird, you know, it reminds me like, you know, this is hard work and this is a really amazing opportunity. I just love to see the birds, even on a four bird day, if a broad wing flies over close by, like it's enough to make the day worth it. The small moments are what's really exciting. So when you have a golden eagle fly in at eye level and you can see the nape of its neck, when you have a dark morph red tailed hawk fly within 15 feet of you, it's an extremely cool experience. Those small moments can carry you through a season. Those are really special and inspirational for continuing work in the raptor field. One, two, one, two, three, four. I can look at the rocket launch, trophy ones of the astronauts. And I will listen to their words, because I like birds. In many types of field work, you live and work with a small group of people, often outside, often in sometimes challenging conditions. That bond forms faster, in my opinion, than a lot of other work situations. With a communal space, living together in the yurt, um, and for warmth, <laughs> we, none of us want to go out and hang out outside alone at night after our work. Um, so we spend nine hours a day together working, and then we really, after work, get to spend time together as well. When you're living and working, all day, every day with, you know, four other people, you get pretty close pretty quick. The team dynamics here are, have been awesome. I have found in the various field works I've had, it's kind of just nice to work with other biology related people, um, even when we all kind of come from different backgrounds. Uh, it's just, we kind of all bond over our love of birds. We are able to disconnect quite heavily from technology, from society. Um, and we're able to explore in great detail the landscape that we're on. We see it change over the course of two months. The leaves change color, the different birds that come through, the way the weather patterns shift. You learn just how to exist and be happy with existing. Like you don't have to be constantly like trying to do something or looking at your phone. It's nice to just like, you can just sit and exist and enjoy like a day. Raptor migration is one of the biggest challenges a raptor faces. Like most of them don't make it into their second year of life. So we're watching them on like one of the most difficult journeys of their lives. So like being able to experience that and like trap them and handle them and even just observe, observe them as they fly by, it's incredible. Like there's, there's no other feeling and very few people will ever get to experience that. And it's just, it's incredible. You learn to appreciate everything. You appreciate a shower so much more when you're up here and 
You appreciate your drinking water knowing that you have to haul the five gallon jug back into the car when you go into town. I think all of us would agree that we'd rather be here than be at a nine to five at a desk because this is more fun for us. Living up here is really unique. It's really unique field work. We're together all the time, but we also kind of get this mountaintop. We get to borrow it for a couple of months and it kind of feels like home. I've gained a lot from Hawkwatch, tons of just rugged field experience. You know, after my first season at Commissary Ridge, I really knew I could do any field job and make it. I absolutely want to be a raptor biologist. Like, I, this has just proved to me even further that this is what I want to do. I know that I want to work with raptors um, and raptor conservation. This is a huge organization that dedicates all of its resources to that. So um, being able to work with them and learn more about how they do that is definitely going to be a step forward in my career. What I value most and what I will take away from my time at Hawkwatch is my love for teaching people, you know, about these birds and developing other biologists. I came in with very little experience. They're excited to train me, they're excited to give me that introduction to this field that I didn't have before. Um, and I feel very fortunate to have four coworkers with a good amount of experience to help, to help get me involved. We get a lot of folks, uh, this may be their first hawk watch, and that can be kind of overwhelming. Uh, we have a first year counter with us this year, and she, but she's doing great because she wants to work. She works and she wants to learn. And to see folks grow as hawk watchers has been one of my greatest uh, pleasures. It's just amazing. Hawk watch is such like a family. I have friends who are doing hawk watch as well, and we all stay really well connected. We all keep talking to each other, and I keep meeting new people. And everyone's really welcoming and really there to help and to mentor and to teach and to like get people going. They recognize that we all love raptors. The more that I interact with different people in this field. It's just different perspectives I see and the more inspiration I have for different directions I can take my career. I eventually want to go to grad school and I know that I'm going to need a lot of field work experience to do that. And so I think, yeah, the, this position will definitely help me with that. There's a lot of experiences through this just in raptor identification and also banding. So I feel really well equipped for either future positions that are involving counting or banding or pursuing grad school where I might be um, needing to use those skills also. At this job and other jobs, you basically get to live and work in places that a lot of people either pay to go to or have to take their own time to go to. And so I feel very lucky to be able to do this for work. The more I keep working in this field, the more I'm like, I couldn't do anything else with my life. There's no way, like, I don't know exactly where the end goal is or where I'm going, but I love to keep doing what I'm doing. And I've learned a lot about myself too, just working these kinds of jobs. So it's been really fulfilling, really satisfying, really helpful for me, like personally and professionally, and I really enjoy it. <laughs> this is just only the start for me. And I know I'm gonna do great things. And I know I'm surrounded by individuals who will help me get there. And so I'm extremely excited for that. And I know that we're, we're all collectively and individually gonna do great things to help everyone, to help raptors in general, to make this world a better place. There's such a long legacy of people who this place has touched so deeply. It's really so special to get to share in that and to come back you know, it feels a little bit more like home, like someplace I'm coming back to. And I get to share that with, you know, hundreds of other people before me, really. You know, some of the rocks up on observations are pretty comfortable. And someone made the comment that they've been polished by 35 years of hawk watchers butts. Um, and it's like, it, it's kind of a funny way of putting it, but it's like, yeah, like 20 years before I was even born, like people were up here doing what I'm doing now, watching the same birds fly by and like, Getting to participate in that is, uh, it's really cool. When this report comes out and, you know, I'll be able to see like all the data that I helped collect. And, you know, it's kind of funny because it just looks like uh, like a dot on a graph or a chart or something, but that, that kind of means so much more to you because, you know, you're the one that was like sitting up here and it's like 30 degrees out and snowing and collecting it. You know, people like to say like, oh, like one person can't make a difference. I don't, I don't believe that in the slightest. I think every single one of us is making a huge difference and we're working together towards this greater effort. 
wildlife is pretty much a gift. Nature's a gift, and it's just something that it's, it's important to protect and to conserve. This Hawk Watch site started before I was even born. And so knowing that I'm contributing, though, to something that has a legacy, that has a future, is a really powerful feeling. I meet people regularly who ask the question, why should I care about the environment? Why should I care about all of these big issues? And sometimes more specifically, why should I care about raptors or about these different species? Studying the natural world and learning more about it and learning how humans can interact with it in a positive way instead of a negative way is really important to me. And that's a, that's a really large picture way to look at it. But when you study one component of that larger picture, such as raptor health and behavior and ecology, you're adding a little, you're giving a little back to the entire picture and seeing how you can contribute in some small way to making it better overall. Knowledge kept is useless, and it's only by sharing that with other people that we really make an impact. And at Hawkwatch International, they do a spectacular job of sharing everything that they can with the public and engaging people. Raptors are incredible. Everybody loves them, and people want to help them. A lot of it is just telling people how. A large important part of conservation work and getting people um, interested in conservation is actually having people out experiencing nature. And so migration is just such a really visual thing that's easy to be like, wow, this is actually happening and maybe now I need to care about it. It's a really heartwarming feeling knowing that you have the power and ability to potentially combine two realities in a resourceful and in a sustainable manner. The two, two worlds being the human world as well as the natural world. And seeing someone's face light up when they understand that, oh, this isn't something mysterious, this isn't something out of touch, this is something I can be a part of too. That inclusion is, puts a smile on my face. <laughs> I love being a part of like this community of wildlife biologists, raptor biologists, environmentalists, scientists who are all working together for the greater good. It's this community that like really supports one another, um, but also supports nature and birds and raptors and wildlife. It's this group of people who are doing things that like probably aren't benefiting them, but they're doing it for the greater good so future generations can benefit from it as well. It's one thing to see this really impressive predator high in the sky looking for prey and to watch it drop at 200 kilometers an hour onto its quarry. And to have the opportunity to see that bird up close, to have a moment of its life, is an absolute privilege. And as a raptor biologist, fundamentally, I feel a really profound sense of responsibility to collect the very best data I possibly can and do everything I can to make it worth that raptor's time. And it's a privilege I don't feel worthy of. And I want to spend the rest of my life doing everything I can until I feel like I might be. Alrighty, this video really gets me in my heart itself. <laughs> okay, so um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, now is your chance to put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A feature, and I will be asking them to Jessica Taylor, our field biologist. And um, Jessica, are you here with me? Are you ready to go? Hi, Sammy, I'm ready. Alrighty, so Jess, before we get started, can you tell the folks how many migration seasons you've done and where you've done them? Sure, so I've done seven full migration seasons. Um, three of those were at Chelan Ridge, which is a Hawkwatch International site. Two of them were at Monzano Mountains, another Hawkwatch International site, and then two of them were a spring site at MPG Ranch um, in Montana with Raptor View Research Institute. Great. Okay, so the first question I have for you is, do we only count in the fall? Um, so Hawkwatch International has one spring count site right now, um, Gunsight in Alaska. 
Um, we used to have um, kind of a partner site to our Monsanto mountains um, called the Sandia Mountains. It was a spring site in New Mexico um, that isn't running anymore. Um, but there are lots of uh, other organizations that do spring migration sites. Great. And for someone looking to get started in the raptor conservation field, um, do you have to have a biology background and is it possible to kind of pivot if you have your education in a different background? Sure, yeah. Um, so I actually started as a, as a music major and then I worked in a, a print shop for a long time uh, before going into biology. And my undergraduate degree is just in wildlife ecology. Um, so it wasn't necessarily focused on, on raptors specifically. Um, but yeah, I know lots of people who, you know, maybe got their undergrad in political science or music or something unrelated and then switched to something um, biology or conservation. So it's definitely, it's definitely possible. Yeah. So if you could start from the beginning and have the perfect raptor biology path, what would that look like? How would you best frame somebody to start their path towards being a raptor biologist? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> it's hard for, for me to answer that a little bit um, because I think that having a diverse background or, or different people with different backgrounds is, is so useful. So like, for example, something that maybe a lot of people don't know about raptor biology is how much work we do with people. Um, so either managing or being on a team, working with community scientists, volunteers, education, it's, it's also important. So I think that um, no matter what your background is, um, yeah, I don't know that there is necessarily an ideal, an ideal setting or, or path because every opportunity that you get can help you in some way so long as you're looking at it um, in, a, in a positive light or in a way that you can build off of your experiences. Um, but I would say that it, one of the advice that I give people a lot is on top of schooling is to just get out there and to just do it. Um, any experience you can have in the field, whether that's, you know, in your backyard or whether that's, you know, spending time with biologists or on migration sites, like just get out there and do it is like, and get experience doing it along with, you know, things like schooling and more formal um, jobs and, and training. So if someone wanted to be a migration crew member for Hawkwatch International, what sort of things do we look for when hiring a migration crew member? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so I would say like first and foremost is just enthusiasm. <laughs> like you, you can see from the video, like how passionate and how excited everybody is to get out there and to, to just witness raptor migration and, and having that that passion is is really important I think to, and something that that I'd, I'd say that we would look for um, on top of that uh, things that are also beneficial is just having you know some background in in raptor identification um, so especially um, yeah I'd say just like getting out there even if it's just you and your in your backyard or a ridge near your house during the migration and then start practicing, start reading books, start, you know, doing that um, kind of thing. Um, also experience camping. <laughs> As you can see, like a lot of people, you know, I didn't have any experience camping when I first started. I, I grew up in Seattle in kind of a suburban area and didn't have any experience. So it's, you know, you can definitely learn, but getting out there and, and camping for 10 weeks at a time as your first camping experience, it, it can be a little tricky, especially when it's cold. So yeah, I mean, stuff like that is, is really beneficial also. If you don't live near a Hawk Watch site, um, are there opportunities for people to Hawk Watch outside of formal migration sites? Yeah, I mean, raptors are migrating everywhere. Um, so it doesn't have to be necessarily a formal migration site. And, and I will say, if you're looking for a migration site near you, you can go to hotcount.org. So it's a website that's um, hosted by Hamana, which is the Hawk Migration Association of North America. And they have this really cool feature where it's just a map of North America and you can click on your state and it'll show you all of the um, hawk watches that, that run in your state. And some of those will be fall or spring. Um, but also just looking for, for um, features. So in the video, we talked about things like um, 
places where good thermals might form or um, ridge lines where those raptors can get some ridge lift and, and you can just go out there and, and watch on your own, try to find those places. Um, or yeah, like some people can just are lucky enough to be able to sit in their backyard um, and just scan the skies and see what they find. Great. Um, do you know if Hawkwatch helps fund um, further education for emerging biologists? I absolutely do know this. <laughs> <laughs> I am one of those people. Yeah, so I um, worked migration for a long time and then as a staff field biologist for a couple of years. And now I'm actually at Boise State University um, where I'm getting my master's degree and I still work for Hawkwatch. So um, as well as some internships that, that that we have for new biologists. Um, so yeah, there's definitely pathways for emerging biologists with, with Hawkwatch International. So now I have some more science-y questions for you. Okay. <laughs> so um, how do field biologists protect themselves from bird diseases and vice versa? So protect the birds um, from human diseases with interaction? Sure. Um, that's a good question. So I think a lot of the bird diseases that, that people get are a lot of times from like long prolonged interactions with birds. So things like bird dander getting into our lungs or from um, potentially like bird um, you know, feces, but that's not really stuff that we deal with too much. So when we are handling birds, we have them for a couple minutes at a time, you know, maybe five to 15 minutes before we just let them let them go and um, of course minimizing um, getting footed by a bird which is when they grab you with their sharp talons um, or getting bit by birds but I think a lot of that too is that they use their their talons and their beaks to um, to eat their prey so a lot of it's kind of mammalian uh, leftovers <laughs> so if we can minimize that but it, it doesn't really seem to be too much of a problem I've I've kind of yet to hear of any big um, disease transfer one way or the other um, in my experience so far from migration um, so this question is about aging raptors so um, more specifically about red-tailed hawks and um, they're asking about the eye color change? They're asking if it changes from light yellow to brown. Um, it does, yeah. So um, the younger they are, and this is in, in videos, but also in exhibitors, um, kind of more strikingly, I think, in exhibitors, but in videos, like the younger birds will often have kind of like a, maybe even a gray when they're really young or kind of a, a light tan color, and it'll kind of turn into this, um, this deep brown color. Um, and then exhibitors go from like a pale gray or pale yellow to yellow to orange, then maybe to like a really deep blood red. Um, harriers will also change their um, the eye color. They, as adults, have like kind of these striking yellow eyes. Cool. So when you see um, raptors migrating, do you notice that they fly in groups of their own species or do they mix with any birds migrating at that time? That's a great question. And this is a fun one because a lot of times you'll see kettles. Um, there are some species that tend to um, accumulate in um, in like really large kettles. So broad-winged hawks, um, turkey vultures, Swainson's hawks, among others. And a lot of times I'll be scanning um, a kettle of, so a, a kettle, um, if you remember from the video, is a group of a bunch of raptors. We saw those, um, shots from Corpus Christi and just those amazing numbers of raptors. So that's a kettle and, and you'll see a kettle of, you know, say turkey vultures and I'll scan through it and look for what I call like the imposter. <laughs> so like a lot of times you'll have maybe one red tailed hawk that's, that's kettling with 40 turkey vultures. Um, and then sometimes it'll be just a, a really interesting mix of species. You have red tailed hawks and Cooper's hawks and, and kestrels that'll all be um, kind of kettling up together. So I think in the video, it also mentioned um, raptors using eyesight to kind of find out where those thermals are. So they'll see another raptor thermaling and, and go with them. So it's, it's a mix of both. Some tend to have large groups of their same species and then some, um, it'll just be kind of a, a mix of a bunch of species. 
So um, I have a question. I'm not sure if they're talking about population size or body size, but the question goes, um, in the 35 or so years you've been collecting data on raptors, are they getting bigger, smaller, or staying the same? Mm, that's a really good question. And I, I'll be honest, I don't have an answer for that. Um, so far as I know, they're mostly staying the same. There may be some evidence, I think, for um, some getting a little bit smaller, but a lot of times it's certain populations. So maybe the Eastern versus the Western population might have a bit of a size difference. But as far as the overall long-term, um, yeah, I'm not really sure. I think probably staying the same, but I don't know that for sure. Great. Um, so, Jess, I don't know if you'll be able to speak on this one, but we'll give it a stab. Mm -hmm. So it says, does Hawk Watch or Conservation Biology have opinions on falconry within the US and are there partnerships between Hawk Watch and various falconry organizations? Mm, that's another good question that I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally qualified to answer, um, but I know that, that falconry has um, really contributed a lot to um, the research science that, that we're doing and the methods that we use to um, capture these birds. Um, but as, as far as like an organizational opinion um, that I can't really speak to. <laughs> That's totally fair. <laughs> um, so I just have um, one more question as far as I'm aware. So if anybody else has any other questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat. Um, and the last one, I'm actually going to answer Jess. So it says, are there any opportunities um, for other facets of conservation, such as environmental journalism within the Hawkwatch organization? Um, so in Hawkwatch, we obviously have the science portion. So that makes up our conservation science department and long-term monitoring and community science. But then we have other departments like education. So those folks go out to schools and different communities to educate um, about the research that we're doing and how they can get involved. Um, and then we also have people in development and admin like me. So I come from a biology background, but um, a lot of the work that I do is writing up blog posts, social media, um, reaching out to news sources and writing up um, information for them. So you can definitely um, use your skills to get involved in conservation. It doesn't have to be just the science side of things. So I do have another chat uh, question coming in the chat, which is what is the most aggressive bird when you're trying to capture and ban them? Oh, that's a fun question. I like these questions. Um, <laughs> so the, the most aggressive bird, so each bird uh, species kind of has their own personality. I, I feel like, um, so some birds are a little bit more calm to handle and some are a little bit more spunky. Um, so I would say, well, two, maybe two come to mind. One would be a goshawk. So stereotypically goshawks will just kind of yell at you the whole time. Um, <laughs> they're, they're much more vocal than some of the other raptors that we, ha we hold um, and then probably uh, falcons in general, but prairie falcons specifically, um, they tend to be quite bitey and um, a little bit more, I guess spunky is the word I'd like to use. <laughs> um, so I also have a question about um, how we track owls and is there a nocturnal, um, <laughs> the, the, the term they use is, is there a nocturnal task force or are there people out there at night counting owls? I mean, there certainly are lots of people out there doing doing owl work. Um, so for the migration specifically, we have in the past trapped um, owls, that it's not something that, that Hawk Watch International is doing right now. Um, there are certainly other organizations that are, and, and we have some, some summer work and breeding work that we do with owls. Um, but as you can imagine, we, we, do, we don't count nocturnal birds the same way we count uh, diurnal raptors. So diurnal would be, you know, during the day because um, they're harder to see because it's at night. Um, so we, we'd have to use more um, trapping methods in order to, to, to track them as opposed to just watching them migrate. Great, thank you. 
So um, we have about eight more minutes. So if you have any last minute questions, feel free to put those in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, in the meantime, I just want to mention that we have a few more events coming up. So this Thursday at 6 p.m. we have our Raptor Trivia event. So if you guys are big bird nerds and want to test your trivia knowledge, come join us. The programs will be about an hour long and your team can be as big as six people. So you and five of your friends can join. And if you can't get a team together, you can also join as an individual and we will place you on a team so you can make some new bird buddies. So, um, and if you want to register for that event, just head to our event calendar on our website, um, and then you can buy your tickets there. So I see that we have a few more questions. So if you band a young raptor, can they outgrow their band? That's a great question. So uh, something that not a lot of people know is that when raptors leave the nest, which is what we call fledging, when they leave, when they fledge, they are full grown. Um, and so they are, are just as big as they're ever going to be. Um, and actually some of some species, um, like burrowing owls, for example, their legs will grow longer um, while they're still in the nest. So, so they're actually bigger um, when they're really small. We have to wait to band them until their, their legs grow longer. <laughs> um, but yeah, any any raptor, especially on migration, that we we band, they're all full grown. So so we wouldn't band a raptor and then have them grow, you know, into their band. Um, we we don't band their legs until their legs are as big as they're going to get. So I think that is all of our questions. So thank you again for joining us today for building the next generation of biologists. Um, so if you enjoyed today's program and are able to, I hope you'll consider making a tax deductible contribution to support these young and up and coming biologists. So you can donate at hawkwatch.org slash donate or by texting hawkwatch, which is all one word, to 56651. Alrighty, so thanks everybody. Have a good rest of your week.